All this meeting so order. This is the regular meeting of the Northfield Public School Board. Today is Monday, May 26, 2015, and the time is 7 p.m. Tuesday, May 26. That's right. And the time is 7 p.m. Okay. Uh, Dr. Richardson, there are a number of items in the table file. Uh, yes, in your table file, you're going to have some information on co-curricular overnight trips. Uh, you're going to have information on personnel in terms of appointments, increase, decrease, and change. Um, in assignments, also information on retirements and resignations, and also an agreement to an extended a to extend a probationary period. And okay. then also an item of information letting you know that we will be having a closed negotiation strategy session immediately following the June 8th uh, school board meeting. Okay. Thank you very much. If there's no objection, we'll add these items to the agenda as we move forward. We now have an opportunity for public comment. This is a chance for members of the district to address the board. Is there anyone here who wishes to address the board? Okay. If you could come to the podium, please. Yes. Um, prior to that, though, however, I'd like to remind you that this is a listening opportunity for the board and not an, a time to debate an issue. Please step to the podium, identify yourself by giving your name and address, and if you represent a group, and your remarks must be limited to three minutes. So, thank you. My name is Cindy Carey. I am um, from Dundas. My address is 117 2nd Street North in Dundas. I'm a parent of a current graduating senior, a parent of two graduates from previous years. I'm also a graduate of the Northfield High School. I've seen 40 years of graduating seniors and um, commencement ceremonies and because I've, I think I've only missed like three. Um, during those years there, there has been losses. Many, many classes have lost students that were far too young to lose for many different reasons and unfortunately and sadly we have lost a student from this graduating class of 2015. Excuse me. Immediately after his death, several of the students started talking um, about ways they would like to, to honor him. Um, they would have brainstorming sessions with each other, and they just kind of assumed that there was going to be recognition of him during their commencement. Um, they would assume the usual things, like there would be an empty chair and j just very simple things that they had seen elsewhere. Um, they approached administration at the high school with thoughts and ideas, things like a small ribbon to be worn in his memory, a special color, a moment of silence, all pretty traditional and often used ideas. Um, but they were put down time and time again. Um, and they were just told, no, we're not mentioning his name, we're not doing, doing anything, uh, we're taking his chair away. Um, and this got the kids pretty upset. And there's a lot of really angry kids right now. And I have had to diffuse some angry kids. Um, they recently, just today in fact, sent around a petition um, to gather signatures of how many people would, would agree. And in just a short amount of time today, they got 120 um, signatures on that. Um, and they turned that into the office um, to um, Mr. Lear. Um, one of the teachers stopped the movement of the petition today and said it wasn't the right time. Well, these kids know that there isn't much time. Commencement is Sunday, so when is the right time if nobody is willing to talk about it? Um, they went to talk to somebody in the guidance office just a short time ago, a few days back, and they were told, I have two minutes to see you. I'm curious what happened to the, our doors are always open with support of staff to any students that need support during this tragic time. These kids have tried and tried in the right ways to get something done in the only way they knew how. Um, and they were told that they're a class, they're not individuals. It's not about individuals, it's about a class. 
Oh, I'm sorry. Um, that whole class is made up of a lot of individuals. Each student is an individual, and all of them together make up this class, and every one of them is important, including the one that we lost. The kids were told that keeping an empty chair was an inconvenience. Um, yes, this student made a bad choice. He made a choice that's permanent and that's very sad. We've been debating mental health issues all over the place for quite some time now. Our kids have been told that now that it would be a downer at the ceremony and that it might make people sad if he were mentioned. Um, but I really question if pushing things into the closet and sweeping things under the carpet are going to make our kids not be sad or make the adults not, not be sad. Um, hiding it is not going to make people not think of it um, or make them just not, not be sad about it. They've been told now, don't talk about him, don't mention him, um, take his chair away, and those things just aren't going to work. We've, we as parents know the importance of talking to our children. We know the importance of talking about the tough things, the tough subjects, and not avoiding them. And now they're being told these things to just avoid it. It's just there's something that isn't just not making sense to me, and it's not making sense to them, and that's why a lot of them are really, really angry. I ask you to think about what we're teaching these kids by ignoring this issue and pushing it aside. It's not that we want sadness at the commencement. Um, in the past, Northfield has honored students who have died, even victims of suicide in the past. What makes this one different? The kids aren't asking for a lot. They really aren't. They just want to make sure that he is recognized, that his name is said, so they can all have a, a, a moment to, to think about him. Um, so thank you for listening, and hopefully the kids will feel heard. Um, this is why they're so angry now, because they don't feel heard. Many of them and some adults are wearing these buttons right now that have been made by a woman from Northfield. Um, but many are feeling afraid that if they wear them that they won't be able to graduate because they have been told that if you do these things, if you mention his names, we will withhold your diploma. And now they were told today, there was, a, there was kind of an impromptu meeting um, today, and that was kind of taken back and said, no, we can't withhold your diploma. Um, and I don't know what the, rule, the rules are on that, but, but I, I just feel like the kids are... Um, feeling blackmailed and they're feeling bullied um, because they just want to do some small tribute. This death is fresh. Emotions are still high, especially for those that knew him well. I ask the school board and the administration to forgive any outbursts of emotional anger um, from any students because it is a very emotional time. Um, sometimes we all react like we don't, we don't want to. But oftentimes in a death, uh, we, we need to do something as a remembrance of our loved one, or, or we create a memorial. It's part of our healing process of, in the grief cycle, and that's what these kids are wanting to do is do something. They want to do something. It's all part of their healing. Um, so I'm hoping that you will please consider helping to just bring about a peaceful resolution between the kids and the administration so that we can have a wonderful celebration on Sunday, May 31st. I know that's what our students' family wants. They have told these kids, you guys, make sure you enjoy your graduation. Let's make it a memorable event for the graduates and let's let the kids do what they need to do as part of their grieving process and part of their healing. We understand that the administration has to proceed carefully in a very sensitive situation, but I really think that we could find a way if everybody just kind of works together, understands each other's hearts, um, and we can make Sunday a very memorable day for our graduates as they go through their ceremony and also remember their good friend. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else here who wishes to address the board? Okay.
Hi, my name is Becky Musel, and I live in Webster, 2035 West 37th Street. Um, I'm a senior this year, and I, I have like two days of school left, and I'm really excited. But um, I was told by a couple people that Alex would be keeping his chair at the graduation ceremony, and then just Friday, I was told that he wouldn't have a chair, he wouldn't have his name read, nothing would be mentioned of him at our graduation ceremony, and that's, personally, I feel like it's not okay. Um, I was in service learning this year. It's a class where you go out in the community and get involved, and um, towards the end of the semester, you do a project, and my project subject was mental illness. And um, so last Wednesday, we presented them, and I started mine out every single time saying, um, there's this kid, and he's in my grade, and his name is Alex Larson. And he made a terrible choice and committed suicide because he had depression and his mental illness took over. And I have depression, OCD, and anxiety, and I don't want my mental illness to get that bad. And my whole point of the project was to show that you can have a discussion about mental illness. And I feel like if we ignore Alex at graduation, you're discouraging people from talking about mental illness and about just anything about like suicide or anything like that. You're just telling them not to talk about it. And uh, it's just, it doesn't matter. You just get over it kind of thing. So um, today we had about 120 students sign a petition to get Alex's chair back and have his name read on the walk with all the other seniors because he would have graduated. He had enough credits and more. He, he should be here, but he's not. And so we decided that just talking to the office wasn't going to help enough. So we decided to um, get about, it was about 20, 25 students to come at the beginning of seventh hour. And we talked to Mr. Lear, just him and then 25, 20 students. And we tried to come to an agreement on what we could do at graduation. And somebody brought up the fact that we're giving him an unmarked plant, having it on stage, and then it's just going to be given to the family. And a lot of the students were really angry about that because the plant isn't personalized at all. It's, it's a plant. Plants die. It's not personalized. We would love, absolutely love, to have his chair out at graduation and have his name read at the ceremony. And if that's, that's too much, then have the plant on his chair or have the plant on a chair that would have been his at, gra at the graduation. Because we all want Alex to be there with us. He'll be with us in our hearts and in memories. But we want a spot for him where he could be. And we want his name read to give us a little bit of closure. Just some time to really understand that he's, he made it. He, he could have graduated. And just to give us that little extra push to know that we can do this too and that we're moving forward because of his, his urge to show us that we can do whatever's possible and that he's watching over us and he's leading us and that he's still loving us and we're still loving him. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else here who wishes to address the board? Okay, thank you. Okay, board members will move on to approval of the minutes. Do you have in your packet minutes for the regular school, school board meeting held on May 11th? Is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Moved by Ellen. Second? Second. Second by Jeff. Any discussion? Okay. All those in favor of approving the minutes for the regular school board meeting held on Mon Monday, May 11th, 2015, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries carries the minutes are approved. We'll move on to announcements and recognition. Dr. Richardson? Okay, I have three announcements this evening. I think first of all we want to uh, announce and recognize that we had the Maroon and Gold Athletic Awards uh, reception which took place last Tuesday. It's 
great night of celebration, especially honoring senior athletes, but also those who participated in state tournaments. Also honored was Rosie Fink, longtime teacher and coach with the Northfield Schools. Rosie was presented with this Distinguished Service Award, gave an eloquent speech talking about the history of girls' sports, when and how they got started, and where they are today. So again, congratulations to those honorees. Uh, the second announcement, basically, are the majority of our 7th and 8th grade students, and approximately 200 of our Northfield High School students attended the first Business and Technical Trades Career Exploration Day last Tuesday morning. The event was hosted by the Career and Technology Booster Club. Students heard a presentation on business and technical career opportunities and could visit booths and displays provided by approximately 30 area businesses and organizations. We'd like to thank John Stenz, who's the chair of the Career and Technology Booster Club and CEO of Force America, for bringing together these businesses and organizations for the program. We'd also like to thank staff members Mark Wotola, Steve Taggart, Julie Woolner, and Ray Coudre for their support and for organizing and providing this excellent program for students. Also, thank you to Benjamin Buss for transporting high school students to the middle school, providing the hot dog lunch for high school students and the exhibitors. So, uh, was very well attended and um, it was a, a great opportunity for students to learn about a variety of different careers as well as uh, a chance to talk to folks from various technical colleges. Finally, we'd like to um, congratulate and thank our DARE graduates for this year from Sibley and Bridgewater um, and Greenville Park, uh, local law enforcement from the Northfield Police Department, uh, along with Rice County Deputy Derek Estrom and the DARE Minnesota program came together to provide both Sibley and Bridgewater fifth graders with the D.A.R.E. program this year after the school resource officer, Angel Borchard, went out on medical leave due to a work-related injury. Uh, each of their respective schools held their, held their uh, D.A.R.E. graduation last Thursday. Again, we'd like to thank all of those that made that happen, and especially to make sure that those two schools that otherwise would have had either a curtailed or no D.A.R.E. program this year we're able to have a very positive experience in terms of the D.A.R.E. program. So again, uh, congratulations to all of our D.A.R.E. graduates and thanks to all of the folks that are involved in making sure that D.A.R.E. program comes off without a hitch. Thank you. Board members, is there anything else? Anyone else would like to add? No. Outstanding musical events this past few weeks. Mm -hmm. And uh, they don't get the recognition they often the sports teams do this time of the year. <coughs> But uh, musical organizations don't get the recognition. And so they were outstanding and much appreciated in the community. Good, thank you. Anyone else? Anne. Um, I just wanted to um, uh, congratulate the um, Latino Play Group. Mm -hmm. It was absolutely fabulous this year and um, had me just riveted the whole time. And also the spring service learning um, presentations just happened oh, a week and a half ago, mm -hmm. and those were wonderful too. Okay, I just had one more thing I wanted to add again. Busy time of the year, so there's lots, lots going on, but um, yesterday, the Northfield Memorial Day celebration, it was really amazing that our school district um, really had the distinctive honor of participating in a very um, wonderful way, as we always do. But um, Nancy Antoine, our principal at Bridgewater Elementary, was the keynote speaker, and she highlighted her Veterans Day event, which she has really done a wonderful job of bringing that whole, um, you know, the aspect of veterans and, and how they've served our countries and how meaningful that is for her kids every day in their Veterans Day events. So she was a keynote speaker, and then two of our students read their essays, and they were um, really, truly wonderful essays in which they articulated what, um, you know, freedom and, and country and patriotism meant to them, and that was senior Erin Hahn um, with her piece entitled Voice of Democracy, and eighth grader Reed Roney with his piece entitled Patriot's Pen. Uh, Mary Williams, of course, and the Northfield High School bands was there as they always are. They were absolutely superb. They did an amazing job of playing all the armed services, different theme songs. So a lot of music for them to learn, and they did a really wonderful job. And that was um, ended with a beautiful um, and quite moving um, ver uh, rendition of Taps played by Jarrett Croy 
and Sebastian Lawler on their trumpet. So um, I know uh, board member Jeff Cornell was there as well, and it was just really an amazing, amazing event, and it was wonderful to see our school district be able to participate in that way. So with that, we will move on to items for discussion and or reports. Our first one being the District Education Program Advisory Committee, affectionately known as DPAC, goals for 2015-16 and here to present is Kyle Wilkham who is one of the community members who serves on that committee and is actually co-chair of the committee along with Helena Kaufman. <laughs> yeah, so I don't have to give a speech about feedback in this year. make it way shorter to write to read the goal. The committee has three subcommittees, assessment, teaching and learning and support services. So the uh, assessment subcommittee has you know, two goals for the 2015 school year. The district will partner with community agencies to serve students by providing meaningful data support and emphasizing key transitions young people make on the creative to career continuum. We will support Northfield Promise with any data they need. Goal. Every professional learning community, PLC, will have a comprehensive formative assessment framework. If you want to do questions on each slide or go back. I would suggest present them all and then give the board a chance to ask any questions that they might have. Okay. That would be great. Teaching and Learning Committee, Northfield Public Schools will develop continuous, accurate, and separate measurements of each student's progress towards academic mastery, work habits, and behavior standards. This goal was the same as last year's. Staff will foster meaningful classroom relationships by increasing awareness of diversity and developing instruction and address multiple learning styles and that address that addresses multiple learning styles and promotes engagement. Leadership will create structures that support this effort. And last, the student support services. Northfield Public Schools will continue the implementation of multi-tiered systems of support, MTSS. For academic and behavioral interventions, implement integrated systems of practice and services that co provide comprehensive supports for social emotional learning and children's mental health, foster school connectedness among students, families, and staff, promoting mutual respect and responsibility in order to enhance engagement. And that's it. I can try to answer questions, but I don't, I'll do too well at it. It's all good. We do have some backups yeah. in the audience. So. <laughs> Board members, do we? Uh, is there questions? Are there questions? I, I just would make the commentary, and Kyle again appreciates you stepping up as the co-chair to continue to do this. Um, I think we had a really good DPAC committee this year. I think people worked very hard on the goals ahead. We had some pretty spirited debate at our meeting last Monday night discussing uh, the structure and syntax and really how they wanted to, to give the message in terms of the goals. And I think that's something I've found through the years with our DPAC program is that uh, people are very free to talk about what their concerns are to try to think about the best way to address those for kids and then giving us the broad goals that we can use as a district uh, to think about uh, significant efforts to make going forward with our PLCs and in our buildings. So thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Uh, thank you, board members. You spend way more time than I do on these subjects. <laughs> well, Kyle, thank you for being here. And, and I think as a board member, I especially appreciate the work that DPAC does. And it really is, um, you know, I've, I've been a part of the committee on and off, but you, you, you really do a, a, a very good job of framing you know we have the the overarching district goals and missions and you really frame that well for schools in terms of how they focus you know where they focus their efforts and um you, i know that these are painstakingly put together and, and every word is is massaged to where the, sc the schools can get this and really <laughs> really understand where they need to go so we really appreciate your work and just out of curiosity how many years have you been on the committee <laughs> I get six or seven. Okay, and I think you've chaired most of those years. 
Well, there's not a lot of responsibility to the public hearing. We've got to read some things to you. Then, yeah. <laughs> Every time they say, and who's going to chair this year, we all turn around yes. and look at Kyle and yeah. Elaine. <laughs> so thank you very much, okay. and thank, thank you, you for being here and for your work. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right, board members, we will move on to our next item for discussion and report, which is the 2015-16 general fund budget. And here is Val Merchstorff, Director of Finance. Good evening. So this is the last, last budget I've got for you. Um, obviously the biggest one, um, but hopefully I'll get you through it. So enrollment, as you're aware, have been, has been really steady uh, for the last several years. We are projecting a slight decline. Um, we're looking at about 4,222.9 um, uh, adjusted pupil units, which is the old WADM, um, which is our weighted calculation. Um, slightly down from, from what we're projecting for this year. Um, I did use the same enrollment projections as I did in January so that the, the numbers would be pretty consistent. Um, and the 14-15 line <coughs> is about 10 off from where we are sitting currently, so that is um, that's good to know that it's at least kind of accurate. <laughs> um, for revenue assumptions, um, despite the $2 billion surplus at the state, it appears we should not plan on a significant <laughs> amount of money, um, so I do just have a 1% uh, increase in the basic revenue formula, which is consistent with what I had presented in January. Um, enrollment does drive about 65% of our total revenue, so that is showing a small decline, which will impact the revenue amounts that you'll see um, here in a few slides. Special education, uh, for 15-16, there is a change in the calculation. Um, it is now the lesser of three formulas. Uh, they said it was supposed to be simpler. It does not appear that that is the case. Um, currently, I'm not comfortable with the, um, the tools that the state's provided and the numbers that I'm generating. So I've kept it pretty conservative. I did project a small increase, um, but probably about half of what was actually projected when I did the calculation. Um, I've talked to several school districts around the area and they all had similar results to I did, that I did and we all said, we're not sure that's actually going to happen, so um, I'd much rather be conservative and then come back with a revised budget when we know that we're actually going to um, get that amount of funding if that's the case. So um, the levy, um, as you recall, in the fall we had a slight increase in that um, from a few different sources. Local sources is typically pretty flat for the most part. Um, that's our activity revenue and those sorts of things. Um, there's a slight increase in that just due to some alignment on participation and that sort of thing. So. For expenditures, um, salaries has an aggregate increase of about 3.5%, uh, which includes the known contracts that we've already settled from last year and an estimated increase in uh, the Northville Education Association contract, which we're currently negotiating. Benefits is largely driven by the increase in salaries for the taxes, and then we also, um, if you recall, had an increased enrollment in health and dental, um, so that's driving that up as well. We do have a $30,000 special assessment for the road work that they're doing by Longfellow, um, so I have included that. Pretty much everything else we held flat. Um, Due to the you know presentation I gave you in January, I didn't want to um, increase anything too much. Um, the expenditures actually came down um, significantly from what I presented in January. I had anticipated our uh, utility costs to continue increasing, and that has not been the case. Um, last winter was apparently way worse than this past winter. So. Um, I did a, a three-year analysis and compared, um, and it looks like we're going to kind of land in the middle of where we were two years ago. So um, that did come down. 
And then, of course, I always just keep this on here. The fund balance goal is 16% of our total expenditures. So this is what it looks like when I pull all those numbers together. Um, sorry, it's a little small to look at, but um, the far right column is the proposed budget. Again, pretty, um, pretty consistent from year to year, which is good. There's just a few items that I would like to call out um, so that you know why they look um, a little bit different. The first, if you're going across the property tax and state switch in 1314, where it looks like we just had $4 million left um, and more, is just the year in which the state paid back the shift. Mm -hmm. So um, it was not new money, it was just basically shifting it between property taxes and the state sources. Um, as you can see, the, the total is not $4 million different. <laughs> so, um, but overall, uh, the state amount, um, you know, is pretty consistent. It increased due to the increase in special education, but decreased slightly, um, kind of balancing that out um, due to the decreased enrollment. So we're looking at about $45.4 million in revenue. Um, this is up from January, again, primarily due to the um, increase in the special education revenue. I believe I held that completely flat in January when I presented. Expenditures, um, you know, 80, 78.5% of our budget is salaries and benefits, so that is our biggest driver. Um, so the percentages kind of go across the board, but we're looking at about 45.8 in total expenditures, which is less than what was presented in January. So overall, we're looking at spending down about 400,000 um, for the 15-16 school year. Um, in January, I had projected about a million. Uh, revenue is a little better, expenditures are a little better, so that came down um, significantly, which is always a good place to be in, um, that we're not gonna have as bad of a time. And the fund balance is actually probably the, the most interesting piece of this. If you recall um, in my internal service fund presentation, I talked about um, how great that fund has been and that we are actually able to move the 580,000 from our restricted funding to the unrestricted. And what that actually does is actually projects us to increase our unrestricted fund balance even though we'll be spending down $400,000 of the fund balance. So we will actually be maintaining about the 23% that we've had for the last couple of years, um, which is pretty great. And then um, just a couple other things I wanted to call out. I, I did address them in my narrative, but in case you were looking at the detail, um, the 13-14 jump for district support here to 14-15, um, is a portion of that is the, the new director of technology position um, and the other portion of that is actually just an account code change. Um, the, the state requires us to code everything based on UFARS and they had shifted um, some of the way we were coding some of the technology expenditures and moved them from the sites and buildings category up to district support. So. Uh, just wanted to call that out because that was one of the bigger jumps. And I think, oh yeah, the fund balance history. Um, I really enjoy this chart. Um, it's a great visual to show how hard the district has worked to um, be responsible and good stewards of the taxpayer dollars. Obviously, this is not a place we want to be in. <laughs> And we've worked very hard over the last several years to increase the fund balance every single year and maintain it. Um, however, we are at a point um, where we are maxing out on the, the referendum and we will be dipping below that um, in the next couple of years. So. It looks great now, and hopefully we can continue to maintain it, but just wanted to um, to know that's always looming out there, but um, but we have been doing a great job thus far. So. Um, that's 
about it. Do you have any specific questions? Board members, other questions? Yeah. I'm just wondering on the expenditures under the general funding proposal. It looks like everything sort of goes up steadily except for vocational instruction and site and building, which kind of go mm -hmm. sort of dip. And I'm just wondering what yep, the so difference is with those. The site and buildings is coming down because we are no longer doing the, the planned um, capital spend down. So that's kind of leveling back out and coming back down to, um, to more of where it was prior. Um, we had um, two, two years of increased spending, so the 5.3 and the 5 million, where we had intentionally spent down that fund balance. And then some of that is just the transition with the coding as well as moving that stuff around. So that's, the, um, that's what's going on with those. And then the vocational is actually, um, we code um, primarily, we had um, one of our high school staff that did a um, point three media specialist position. And so her salary gets partially recoded. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's just kind of a shift in, in the way her salary was coded. And now she's going to be 100%, so it's coming back up. That's the, the primary change, I guess. And that vocational piece is limited to very specific subject areas, and there's a license required, um, spe specific license required. And, uh, Val is exactly right. There was one year, one of our vocationally certified people took it, had a different position within the district, so we weren't able to code that part of her salary to the vocational department. Mm -hmm. Um, I know that this is going to come up later in our agenda, the um, Southeast uh, Minnesota Special Ed Cooperative that is yep. going to be presented. Is there anything in the um, proposed budget that is no. takes that into consideration? No. no, I didn't um, because it's not finalized. Right. I didn't want to um, make assumptions and frankly guessing the numbers at this point would be challenging um, until we have some more concrete plans. So I did not include it okay. in here. Board members, any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Phil. Right. Thank you. We hope by the next board meeting we may know what that actual increase is. Well, they are saying sometime in June. Huh. I think it depends on how long it takes them to get the tent erected. <laughs> Of course, we're referring to our state legislators right now, and the, and the lack of an education omnibus bill as we sit here past the session. Okay. No, has a comment. Oh, I'm sorry, no. I always have a comment. <laughs> I can't miss the opportunity to say it may be a circus tent. Yeah, I was going to go there, no, but I thought better of it. Do respect the position. Let me take that one. All right. Very good. <laughs> Julie, I, just, I think this is an opportune moment for us to point out why fund balance is so important. I mean, there's a, there is a possibility that the D Department of Ed could shut down. I mean, it's not out of the realm of possibility here. And the fact is there's going to be a lot of schools that, are, if that were to happen, will have to be going and borrowing money to make their payments and their cash flow. And this is why we have two plus months of operating expenses. It wasn't all that long ago that we had to use that for exactly a similar reason. So. It's just another example of our fiscal stewardship um, preventing the district from having to spend money on interest. And so while the legislature is having a hard time working it out with the governor, we stand in a good position because of the long-standing stewardship that we've tried under Dr. Richardson's leadership and Val and other previous finance directors. We shouldn't miss that opportunity to call that out, that fund balance is good. It's, ex it's exactly why we have done it for the last decade. We always remain cautiously optimistic, right. but yet we're disappointed at every turn. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments board members have? Okay. We'll move on now to activity fees for 2015-16, and here is Activities Director Tom Broutman to present that. Good evening, everybody. Uh, just a quick comment, man. I brought it worse so it would be still in my heart. <laughs> and we shut down, I just down the benefits. You know. Yes. 
couple of this. <laughs> um, in your packet, there's going to be a couple sheets that show the current fee structure and also a proposed fee structure. Um, if you could look at the one that says proposed, I'm just going to kind of read off the top just to get some framing um, as we continue here. So um, we're looking to propose to increase the activity fees for middle school athletics by five dollars. And that's really to cover online registration, which we are um, ho hopefully going to uh, venture into uh, for the next school year. And then also middle school academic and fine art activities by five dollars. Okay, to see those raised by five. Also to raise by five dollars, high school academic and fine art activities. And then to note, um, this last bullet item says that high school athletics will increase by $10. And that's, again, to cover that $5 online registration cost in addition to a $5 cost to increase our athletic training services. Um, so that's what we're looking at doing. This page that you're looking at then shows the proposed increase. So if you look at the very top item under the title athletics at the high school, the $260 figure that goes over to Alpine Ski, that's already now a $10 increase from the current structure. So it currently is at $250. So we're looking at a $260 activity fee for Alpine Ski. To go across the page a little bit, if you look for those folks that qualify for a reduced meal plan, they get 40% of that 260, so they're at $104. And then a free meal lunch plan is at 52. So in essence, we're raising activity fees for athletics by $10. But if you compare this with the current, when you compare it with reduced meal, it's a $4 increase from what it is currently, and a $2 increase for what it would be currently for a free meal plan. So that frames it up a little bit, a little bit more. And then going down the page, um, once we get to the bottom half of the of the section, everything below academic and fine art activities at the high school, those have now been increased by five dollars. So currently, our academic um, fees for the high school are sixty-five dollars. This shows seventy, so it has the five dollar increase. And then going across that line. That $28 for the reduced meal plan, that's a $2 increase now. And the uh, $14 free meal plan, that's a $1 increase. Um, so we'll look, that's what we're looking at, so I just wanted to frame that up. Um, the other thing that I think is important to know that these have been uh, looked at and approved by the, act or the Activities Advisory Committee, um, so we do have um, their support in this as well. Um, some other things, a little bit of history um, that um, someone very astute thought would be good to bring forward. Um, we put the free and reduced structure into our activity fee um, program back in 2012-13. So it's not that long ago where we added that, but with that said, and Val even noted that, um, we have not seen a drop in activity participants. If anything, we're seeing um, quite an increase. Part of that, too, is due to uh, adding some new sports. You know, lacrosse is relatively new. We had Clay Target, and Clay Target has 85 participants of its own. So, um, so activities still um, are doing very, very well, and I think the free reduced plan has definitely not hurt our participation at all. So a nice job by the board um, putting that through. The last time that we increased activity fees was going into school year 2011-2012. <laughs> At that time, we increased from the previous year by $15. And that was really budgetary. This time, what we're looking at is not really budgetary, it's more to provide service. The online registration service for parents, and, and I think that would be a big convenience, and then certainly the athletic training, which I'll um, delineate some, some things regarding that in a little bit. Also, in the 2009-10 school year, so just really a couple of years before that $15 increase, <coughs> that increased by $10 as well. So again, these were all budgetary increases at that time. Focusing in a little bit about with the athletic training um, contract, 
we're due every two years, the board approves it, uh, another two years with the um, CSMR in, in town. And they provide an outstanding service for our students. Um, what we get is really top-notch care. And it's not only um, care when there's injuries, but it's proactive. It's being proactive and um, setting our kids up so they don't get injured. So we get outstanding care from the CSMR, and in particular, our athletic trainer, John Sand, and his wife, Leah, which I'll bring in a little bit more with this proposal. Um, in the last go-around, and part of this is the May 9 conference, we have seen a change in what we provide with our athletic training services. So really, the, we were getting a pretty big deal these last couple of years, um, and really the actual hours that are being put in um, are a lot more than the hours that we're paying currently uh, for athletic training services. Um, so we're looking to change that. Um, also, the uh, CSMR is adding a 2% increase. So instead of $28.50 per hour, we're looking at a $29 per hour charge for athletic training services. Again, a 2% increase. So looking at that, I had John really uh, put pencil to paper and, and I wanted to bring something to the board that would be detailed information when we made these kind of decisions. One of them is the reality of John Sands' job. The contract says he starts at three. In reality, it's 2.45. And in some cases, it's even during the school day. He's a teacher here and sometimes John will see kids and be called to see someone during the school day. Maybe not during class, but during his prep hour. And he does it, he doesn't complain about it, and again, it's quite a service. The other thing we have is the big relationship that John has with our kids and the trust with our parents. It's, it's really a great deal. With that said, our contract says he starts at three. He's done with the training room at 2.45. So there's 15 minutes every single day that's not built into the contract. That needs to get built into the contract. Those 15 minutes. They come in 2.45, or for sure 2.46, there's kids in line at John's door to get treated. The big part of the proposal uh, to increase, and I think something that will really help, is to add Leah Sand to the mix for 30 minutes a day so that we can get our kids turned around to the training room, treated properly, back to practices or to a bus, to their game, whatever they're participating in, in a more timely manner, and really treat them. I think they're getting great treatment already, but I think this is even a better deal. Certainly, this is going to increase efficiency. It's going to make the, the participants happier, but it's going to make the coaches happier, too, to get those kids to their practices and their events. The other thing that's part of the proposal that I really like as the activities director is for me to stay on duty on Wednesdays till 5 o'clock. And what that's going to do, it's going to uh, create John to be able to leave the training room and do outreach work with those students that maybe aren't on this campus. They could be at the hockey arena, at Spring Creek Park, at the middle school. We have kids all over the place, obviously the gymnastics club to see those kids that he knows have injuries, but they're not coming in to get proper treatment because they want to just go to practice and they want to do their thing. So he wants to go out and work with coaches and work with those kids to really provide that kind of service. Bullet items by John. Here's what he thinks will help having that second athletic trainer at this level. One, athletes practice sooner. Increased communication to coaches and parents. Improve treatment for athletes. Have an opportunity to provide athletic training services at practice. Improve the safety of our athletes and improve documentation of athletes, which is certainly a big liability issue. He does it now, but he thinks that he can do a better job with that. So those are the things that we would get um, from the um, athletic training contract. And again, the $5 cost for athletic training on activity fees will help um, uh, offset some of those costs that the district would lose, certainly, um, uh, 
because of paying for those additional services. And only online registration is the second piece or the first piece. Questions? Well, then there's other questions. Ellen. I actually have a comment, and I was just going to support um, what you were talking about with the trainers. And um, my daughter had a concussion this year, and the protocol that they have, the pre screening, and the protocol they have, and the clinic said that it's a model of how they're implementing it at Northfield for the rest of the state, and the communication to parents, too. It's not just that they see the kids, but we, you know, had really strong communications as to where she was in the process. And I mean, it just made you much more comfortable. So. Thank you, Ellen. Oh, can I comment on that? I'm going to comment on that. <laughs> um, first of all, I think our, I think our school district's a model. Um, other, other school districts have come to me and they have, have asked me about what do we do with our concussions and concussion protocol. Um, so it's not just me answering those questions. I will, I'll have John directly tell them, here's what we do and here's how we do it. Jeff. Question. Uh, just to thank you for all your, your hard work on this. And I'm on the uh, uh, AAC committee and liaison for sports and, and uh, activities. And I, I think the main thing, and the main thing was the um, kind of trying to get into the figure out how to disperse and get some money for the, the five dollar fee to get the to, to allow people to use uh, credit cards and things like that. So obviously that's a time that uh, we should be up to that. And that was five dollars as a part of that. And and you know, we're already doing a good job with the uh, the SANS, and they're doing a good job. So I think that just to, to really rekindle that and make sure that they're happy and, and we're happy and everything's going fine with that. So uh, and they also did a very good job with with all the emails going back, and you really took advantage of how a good uh, activity advisory committee is supposed to work, putting the question out there and getting a lot of feedback. And I think you kind of massaged that, came up with some numbers, kind of went back and, and uh, came up with a good solution. So I appreciate all your hard work on that. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, I think uh, the first item that went out did get massaged by this really thoughtful group. And I think we, we do have, um, uh, way in front of us now, uh, the best situation we can have. Thank you. Just to remind me, I can be batted for things like um, gymnastics includes transportation fee or soccer includes the use of the park. As I recall, for Clay Target, there was basically no cost to the district for that. So I'm just wondering what, for some of these sports, what the fee actually goes to. Um, actually, Clay Target, we are paying um, for the registration fees. Uh, to be a member of the Minnesota Clay Target League, which is $25 per participant. We're also going to pay $25 per participant that um, participates in the, there's actually two state tournaments for the Clay Target, and there's one basically that um, students don't really need to um, hit a certain target. Um, to <laughs> and, and a lot of our kids will opt to go to that. I believe it will be a great experience. And that's a $25 charge. So now we're up to $50. There is the second state tournament that's another $25 charge, but that is a, um, uh, they have to qualify for that. And right now we have three kids that have already qualified out of the 85 for that state tournament. I don't think we're going to have a lot more. If we have up to 10, that would be a major success for them to get there. So there are some charges and some costs associated with that. And then, just like anybody else, there's the chenille N, the letter certificate, all the pins, buttons, snaps, and buckles that go along with the activities as well. So there, there are costs associated um, with all of our activities. And that one, too. Thanks. Any other questions? Um, I have two questions. Um, where do we compare to other big nine schools in terms of our activity fees? Yeah. I did a recent, and it was a really quick analysis um, because this was a quicker turnaround with the athletic training contract. I, I received uh, most, something back from most every big nine school, not all big nine schools. We're going to be now with this in the um, half to upper half of activity fees with the highest average activity fee um, from my study at Rochester. So the three Rochester schools, their average fee is about $180. 
at our average fee, when we average this out, is really now going to be about $165. That's about middle ground for us. Uh, Mankato is right about at six, at 160, um, and then there's others that hover right in that 150, 150 range. Okay. Now, um, this, uh, the approval of this increase in the activity fee would be a um, item for individual action at our next board meeting. But if it were to um, be approved, would you, when would you anticipate the online registration being available for parents? Would it be as early as fall? Sports or not that early? Oh, we would definitely, we will definitely put this into place. Okay. Uh, we have a company that we're, we've been working with, and we would work with this company in the month of June, and I would hope by July 1 we'll have this up and running, so we will have online registration for fall of 15. Okay. And look at Val a little bit, because Val, <laughs> Val also has been working with this company and working closely with our department and, and us with her. Um, because this is a contract that she would need to um, solidify. Okay, good. All right. Thank you very much for the presentation. Okay, we will move on to our next item for discussion and report will be the proposed Southeast Minnesota Special Education Cooperative. Dr. Richardson will be doing that presentation. This evening I would like to spend some time with you and I'd like to tell you I can do this in five minutes but I can't. <laughs> um, this really has been several years in the making although the all the real work has occurred in about the last three or four months. Uh, if you think back uh, to 2405, that is when we first implemented our joint powers agreement with Faribault with the idea that in that joint powers agreement we would be looking at strategies to help us support our students of highest need, our level four special education students. That's been a really good option for us over the last decade because it has allowed us to um, have more access to programming, re significantly reduce the number of students that we had to send to other placements which were much more expensive and uh, gave us the opportunity to really jointly run that program because it was a joint powers agreement. We worked together uh, in terms of jointly uh, covering all the costs but also jointly actually running the program uh, with the staff that was hired for CREC. The situation that we have right now is that special education law and statutes in the state have changed significantly. And as part of that, the ability to continue to do a joint powers agreement between two districts is no longer going to be available to us after the 2015-16 year. In fact, for most districts, it isn't available beginning in 2015-16, but because we have individuals among us, like Cheryl and others, <coughs> who know the folks at the department very well and are able to sit down and talk with them, we have been given the opportunity to continue with the current joint powers agreement for one more year. At the end of that year, however, we are going to have to have a new structure in place to support our highest need students. At the same time we were looking at that situation, we began to have some conversations with four of the other districts that are part of our new Big Nine Conference. And we found that we were having basically a similar discussion, and that is we have students with some really high levels of need in terms of EBD, in terms of uh, low incidence programming, and students with very unique needs. And uh, not only does Faribault and Northfield have those issues, but also Oatana and Austin and Albert Lee. And so we began discussing uh, several months ago the concept of given the, that we can no longer operate in the format that we're in, should we be looking at trying to create a new structure? And that new structure is a co-op structure, which is what we're going to talk about tonight. So as you listen tonight, be aware that there are some things that are going with the statutory changes that really make it impossible for us to continue as we currently are 
beyond next year. And that the proposal we're giving you really is something that will take almost a full year to prepare to fully implement. Because we're really talking about putting together all of the structure in terms of creating the co-op, in terms of uh, leasing the building, in terms of building out the building to appropriately meet the needs of kids, in terms of figuring out all the policies and procedures and process, and making sure that we're ready to go. The advantages, however, I think will be very clear to you as we kind of go forward with this discussion. So let's just take a look at some of those pieces. So what's our issue? Basically, our issue is that we have federal and state law that requires districts to provide <coughs> special ed instruction. And to meet those needs, we have to provide a continuum of alternative placements that could go all the way from instruction rate or classes to special schools, to home instruction, or to even instruction in hospital institutions. So we are tasked as a school district with having to have all those options available to support and meet the needs of our kids. What we know is that some of our kids' needs and behaviors are so intense that they really can't be effectively addressed in a general school setting. We refer to these students as having low incidence disabilities because the percentage of the special education students we have in our population is fairly small compared to the total population of special ed students. Our problem is how do we find the special ed programs that can provide those kinds of intensive services and uh, make sure that we can meet the need mandates that we currently have. So really there are three options for us to consider. And right now, districts our size really have to look at those three pieces. If we were a Minneapolis or St. Paul, we could probably run all of these programs ourselves without having any other districts belonging or working with us. But districts of our size, and typically if you think about the districts that we're talking about, those five districts, we're looking at districts that are anywhere from 2,500 students to 6,000 students. And at that size, while we can support a number of our special education programs, programs for the students with these needs can't be done um, by ourselves. So the first option is you create an isolated program within the district and try to serve the one or two students that you may have that have that specific set of needs. The kids do receive the instruction that they require. We have total control of the program and the cost. Any MA or, or medical assistance uh, revenue that can be generated comes right back to our special ed program. But when we take a look at it, if we try to run a program like that inside our system, it could be very disruptive to other students in the building. And you may have heard from parents at various times that even the programs that we have sometimes for our level three students can be very disruptive in the building. Students are isolated, they have very little opportunity for socialization, peer modeling, group instruction because it's a very small number of kids. Mm -hmm. Staff tend to burn out. Uh, absentee and turnover is really high when you have a small number of students with a teacher who spends the entire day with them. We may need to create a new program whenever students needs uh, a different type of intensive service. So in other words, if we have a student whose needs change or intensify, then we have to actually come back and try to create a different program or an enhanced or an augmented program to meet their needs. It tends to be the most inefficient service delivery model that we can provide, and as a result, it's extremely high per pupil cost. So if you're trying to do this by yourself, it's very costly, it's not very effective, it's not very efficient, and it has a tremendous turnover and burnout rate for the staff who need to work those programs. So there's a second option. The second option is you send students to another district that has the needed specialized programs and services. Eleven years ago, we were sending a number of our students to District 917, which is located in Farmington and, and uh, uh, Rosemont Apple Valley Egan and, and on up into the southern part of the metro. That's an option that we can always look at. Students receive the specialized instruction and services they require. Students have an opportunity for socialization and peer modeling and group instruction. 
they get uh, the staff that they're working with the kids have very specialized training and the support that they need because there's a number of students coming together at the same time any MA uh, revenue that's generated by our students then belongs to the providing district so it doesn't have any positive impact on our costs in other words we're paying a bill a tuition bill for those um, groups or those districts or that district that provides the program other districts are not required to accept our students and so what could happen is a student moves into our system that has a really high level of need in a particular area the um, program that's that's currently operating is already full they are going to first take care of the students that are in their member districts and only if there's an available slot can they uh, allow another district to come in we're hearing that already from several of the other uh, big nine schools that are part of this process and this discussion because they're running into exactly that issue of saying we're trying to find a program we're trying to find a program and there's no program that's open or available you have no voice in managing the program or controlling the cost you may have to transport long distances so if you think about the idea of us transporting not just a 917 but maybe 916 287 in the West Metro uh, you've got significant transportation and it's all swimming upstream in other words you're traveling into the cities at the same time everybody else is trying to do that you're traveling out when everybody's trying to get out so it, it makes that transportation even longer and more difficult because of the location of these types of programs it's expensive uh, because now we're paying the administrative overhead for another district to run the program okay the third option is that we can join neighboring districts to create and provide specialized programs and services in that case again students receive the kinds of instruction and services they require they have all the opportunities for socialization peer modeling group instruction we have a voice in managing the program and controlling costs because we are running it it's a cooperative program any MA building building basically generated by our uh, students reduces our costs staff are provided the training because we're bringing five districts together to actually make that happen there are specialized programs and services available whenever our students need them so unlike the situation where you're having to go to like a 287 or a 917 and hoping that they have an opening here the there would always be openings for member districts it's still expensive but it is less costly than the other two options so why should we co cooperate well we believe we should cooperate uh, because it gives us a sufficient number of students with poets and disabilities we can provide specialized programs and really target the needs of our students we can provide interventions and therapies and treatments and equipment and facilities needed to be successful in educating these kids we can recruit we can train we can support we can retain the staff with the expertise to work effectively with students with intensive needs and if you think about it the level of expertise needed for these staff members is very high and the number of those folks out there is not very high we can spread the cost among a larger number of students thereby reducing the per pupil cost which is a really important piece and very different than option one if you're trying to do it yourself with one or two students with a particular disability area there's some additional benefits we need to look at first of all we can choose to work jointly to improve services reduce costs in terms of special ed workshop and training we can work together we can hire specialists full-time where typically our own district would only be able to actively use that person for maybe a small portion of the time now we can look at full-time folks autism specialists teachers of the visually impaired other things that might be necessary and you can do when you have 30 or 40 or 50 kids together that you can't do when you have just a few we have access to specialized curriculum and materials and equipment that could only be used occasionally so the, the positive piece there is we have the equipment we need and with that number of students it's much more likely that another student may need that equipment at some time 
where otherwise, oftentimes, if you're trying to run your own program, you may buy a piece of equipment, it's used for a year, and then it sits because you don't have another student that has that need. We also are able to look at employment contracts, salaries, and benefits that are tailored to support the specialized mission of the cooperative. Because this is a cooperative, it is its own school district. It is not tied to Northfield or Faribault or Owatonna or Austin or Albert Lee. So you start out with creating a contract that really is all about serving special education students. And we can think about what needs to be done to best make that happen. We have operational policies and procedures that can be tailored to address the unique needs of the students that we serve. We can implement alternative educational programs and practices, which oftentimes an individual district is going to be really reluctant to try to attempt. Also, when we think about why we should cooperate, I think we have to remember that except for the very largest districts, which have enough of these low incidence students to run all of their own programs, the vast majority of Minnesota's districts belong to a co-op, to an ed district, or to an intermediate district that provides programs for students with low incidence disabilities. Even Osseo belonged to 287, and a, a number of our level four programs were still provided there. We were the fifth largest district in the state. We had 22,000 students. So the idea that there's very few districts that can do this, we're talking about very, very few that can actually do it alone. This way we have the ability to make this happen, and most districts in the state belong to one of these different formats of cooperation. Because it's the most efficient and cost-effective way to provide specialized ser services that these students require and teach in districts are mandated to provide. So that's why people come together. It's more efficient, it's more cost-effective, it provides the kind of specialized services that, that we need for the kids and that we are mandated as districts to provide. So here's an example. Basically, a district has two students with a particular set of low incidence disabilities that require specialized programming. We do a district program. Program cost, a teacher and a para, 100,000 bucks. Special ed aid, uh, we probably get about $45,000 or 45% of that money back in special ed aid. Our net program cost is about $55,000, above and beyond what the state provides. If we have two students to operate the program, the cost per student is about $27,500 per kid. If we look at a cooperative program, we have program cost, we have still one teacher, we may have five parents, one for almost every one of our kids. $240,000 program cost, you say, gee, that's a lot of money. And special ed aid, of course, is still about 45% at $108,000. Net program cost is about $132,000. But if you've got six kids in the program instead of two, your cost, net cost per student is about $22,000. So immediately you see the impact of having more students and what impact that has on efficiencies of operation. Right now we have 21 students who are in level four or level five program, 19 in level four, two in level five. They have low incident disabilities that need more intensive services and we can provide them more work by ourselves. Joining with other districts could give us access to programs we need to serve students. Joining a cooperative is like taking out insurance. We may not need a particular program or service right now, but if we do in the future, that program service or service is there for us to access. So right immediately we may not need to access every program that the co-op would provide. But at some point if we need that program, we need it. And in terms of it being like insurance, it really isn't about if we need it, but it's about when we need it. So the proposal that we're sharing with you tonight is to create the Southeast Minnesota Special Education Cooperative. I don't know if this is the name we're going to finally land on. SEMSEC sounded better than some of the other uh, acronyms we could <laughs> come up with. Uh, basically, uh, the purpose of the SEMSEC program is to serve the needs of students with low incidence from the following member districts. And again, as I shared, 
those are the five districts that are involved. Basically all along the 35 corridor, Austin probably the farthest off the beaten path in terms of heading toward Rochester. The SEMSEC programs could include things like federal setting for or level for EBD, could include day treatment, could include students with unique needs or SUN program students, could include secondary transition students, and it could include any other federal setting for programming that is needed by member districts. Does it have to include all of these programs? No, it doesn't. Right now, the initial discussions we've had, the, the programs that I think people are most interested in uh, supporting are the level four EBD and the level four student with unique pro needs programs as being the two programs that have the greatest level of need across the five districts right now. The governance of the program, basically you would create a cooperative board that would be responsible for the overall governance, governance of SEMSEC. You'd have two representatives from each member district. You'd have a school board member and you'd have a superintendent. The purpose there is that by state statute, any kind of a board like this, because you're actually creating a new cooperative school district, <coughs> has to have people that are actually elected. So there would be an appointment of one of our elected school board members to participate, and the superintendent from each district would be part of that. Each district has one vote. The board would meet monthly. It would elect its own chair, vice chair, and clerk treasurer. And the co-op director would be an ex officio non-voting member of the board. Basically, the co-op board has legal authority under Minnesota Statute 471.59. They can adopt policies, bylaws, procedures to govern the operation. They can develop an annual budget, approve expenditures. They can enter into contracts for services, goods, and property. They can hire co-op director and other employees as needed. They can do what is reasonably necessary to achieve the purposes of the co-op. We'd also be looking at implementing an advisory council that would be composed of the directors of special education from each of the member districts. So they would really be the panel of experts who would be able to support the operation of the co-op and make sure that we are doing things that are going to be in the best interest of the students in each district. The, the advisory council would meet with the co-op director to provide guidance on a monthly basis in looking at policies and practices, in terms of coordination of services, in terms of other issues regarding programs and services, and would also recommend operational policies and procedures to the co-op board. The SEMSEC would have a cooperative director. That person would be licensed as the director of special education. They'd oversee the direct operation of the cooperative. The idea is that we don't want to end up with Cheryl and other special education directors having to take on that role. We, we want to have this be uh, a situation where we have a person who can focus totally on making sure that these programs are successful. So we're looking for a special ed director who would, will run the program on a day-to-day -day basis with advice from special education directors in the districts and the oversight from the board and superintendents in each of the districts. That person who uh, would be hired as the co-op director would recruit, assign, supervise, evaluate staff, would manage the budget, would implement policies and procedures, and would be an ex officio member of the co-op board. With the board chair, they would develop the board agendas, they'd prepare the board minutes. We'd also need to look at payroll and bookkeeping. And there's several options we could use to do that. We could look at hiring our own bookkeeper. We could look at purchasing services from one of the member districts, which we think is probably the most realistic way to get that done, since every district already has payroll and bookkeeping programming, already has uh, the work that can be done there, and we um, feel that that may be a much more effective way of doing it than actually trying to hire and train our own payroll and bookkeeping program. Or we can contract with a business or agency. So there's several options we can go at there. In terms of financing, we would have access to state special ed funding to offset the costs of 
Special Education Administration instruction, related services support staff, all of our curriculum supplies and equipment, virtually all of the special education office expenses. The one very powerful piece in terms of the creation of a special ed co-op is unlike even in our system where you think back when Gary was here we were running a director of student services. He had special education but he also was doing title programming and also doing other programs. So he had literally to fit, have to figure out uh, how much of his salary could go towards special ed. Were there supplies or materials that had to be split out and so on. The good thing about this because MSEC's singular purpose is to meet the needs of special ed students. Everything that's done at SEMSEC can be uh, built into the financing and funding process. Any contracted services, mental health therapy, etc. We'd also have access to MA build it, billing for health related IEP services for eligible students because SEMSEC, just like any other school district, has the ability to do MA billing. We could also apply for special grants and projects when they available because we would be a school district. We also in terms of financing would lease spaces for our programs. The while there is the ability in some circumstances to purchase facilities, the most logical approach we believe is to do a lease agreement and the core there is to do a long term lease and, and, and put all of the build out costs or creating the facility as part of the lease agreement. And what we know is that we're looking at major build out of any facility that might currently exist. Uh, and that's because even as we've worked with CREC over the last decade, we see the uh, disadvantages of trying to, to work with a building that was built out thinking that it um, did not need to be a hardened structure. It did not, in other words, uh, sheetrock walls and steel studs works fine if you're in an office building. It doesn't work fine if you have a student that melts down on occasion or really struggles to, to control their behavior and their emotions. And so when you talk about creating a hard structure, you're talking about uh, walls that have plywood behind the, the um, sheetrock. You have cement block walls when it's appropriate. You have doors and hinges and other kinds of pieces that are going to do that. Plus you build a building that really makes sense for these students and Cheryl and other special ed directors uh, actually went and visited several sites and have looked at some buildings that were built out of existing structures and while I know they all looked at the building that was a brand new building and said oh wow, <laughs> I think they also looked at the building that was renovated and said this could really work. And so what we're really looking at trying to do would be looking at uh, leasing a space that would make that work, but also having some time to get that building built out before we had students come in. We share the cost based on the prior year's December 1 unduplicated special ed count. So again, if we have 3,000 uh, count in terms of, of the district's count and we have 600 in a particular district, you'd pay one-fifth of the lease cost. You'd access lease levy funding to cover these costs. So basically, we have the ability, and there's a, there's a structure already to allow individual districts to do lease levy so that we could generate the money to basically cover the cost of the lease and also the build-out that would be built into it. It could be a lease to purchase agreement as another option. Uh, districts placing students in SEMSEC then would be billed for the unreimbursed program cost via the state tuition billing system. It'd be billed the uh, reimbursed costs from one to one pair of professionals that are assigned specifically to their student. As you can think about it, there will be a lot of the kids that will have a one on one pair. Admitting non member district students on a space available basis is a possibility for us with SEMSEC because we could actually reduce everybody's tuition cost by spreading the cost over larger number of students. At the same time, we want to be very, very careful about how we did that because we would never want to get in a position where we sold all the slots and then one of our students needs a slot and we either have to create a brand new program or try to extricate someone. So 
the focus would always be to be very careful about admitting those uh, non-member district students into the program. Any SEMSEC expenses that aren't reimbursable under state special ed funding are still included in the state tuition bill. So co-op insurance, utilities, board expenses, custodial services, building maintenance, grounds up, et cetera, can all be part of the overall state tuition. Because everything in terms of special ed and all non-special ed expenditures are included in the calculations, once SEMSEC is in full operation, tuition payments are flowing uh, from MDE will be financially self-sustaining. So while there is going to be upfront costs as we move forward, once the program is up and running, there will be enough money generated to self-sustain. So we're not looking at districts having to come up with additional extra dollars once the implementation of the program begins. Basically, under Minnesota rules, the district placing the student is still responsible for conducting the IEP meeting that places the kid you know, at SEMSEC. We still would have to work with SEMSEC staff to develop the IEP placing the student in the cooperative. We'd still need to provide transportation to and from SEMSEC SEC programs. And if there was a due process dispute, attorney fees and due process hearing costs involving a particular student are still the responsibility of the individual districts. Because tuition payments for the co-op will lag behind expenditures, we know that we're going to have to cover, if we implement this, the startup costs of SEMSEC, including a, uh, the initial payroll and expenses during the first few months. The money will come back to us, but we'll need to be able to, to fund that upfront startup. Think of it basically as an upfront investment that gives us access when we need it to any specialized program whenever one of our students needs it. It also has the potential to lower the cost of providing special ed services to students with low incidence disabilities. So what's the worst case scenario? Well, the worst case scenario is the net cost of educating students with low incidence disabilities will be the same as they are now. However, if you look at the quality and breadth of services available, they'll be superior to anything that we can provide as a single district. Because again, we'd be able to hire the additional staff, we'd be able to provide the specific support services, and we'd be able to make sure that the specific programs that students need could be provided. And when that next student with full incidence disability appears, there will be a program available to provide the special services they require. And that's the most important piece. A more likely scenario is that the cost of educating students with low incidence disabilities will actually be lower than it is now. And the quality and breadth will be superior. And when that next student appears, there will be the program that's needed. So what are the next steps? Well, basically, for the past several, Cheryl and Val and Matt and I have been meeting with our counterparts from four other districts to discuss how could we put this together and how could we implement the program. We made a conscious decision to take a lead role in terms of the discussion and offered the opportunity initially to develop uh, an overall uh, draft of, of what this thing might look like. Uh, when the other districts saw what we had presented, there was an interest in taking it the next step. At that point, um, we, in our team anyway, looked at each other and we said, Who's the best person we know of to develop the detail of this particular plan? And all of this came to the conclusion that Dr. Gary Lewis was the person we needed to seek out. And so we basically entered into a consulting contract with Dr. Lewis, that, who basically then developed not only this PowerPoint, but the agreement, the resolution, 29 policies to get the, the board started in terms of the core policies that are needed for special education cooperative, plus basically laying out all of the kind of core details in terms of a timeline that would be implemented over the next 12 months beginning July 1 that would get us prepared to actually implement SEMSEC in uh, July of 2016. Um, we, we really felt that as, as we went forward that the more we talked about this, it seemed like the right direction to go. 
We are really convinced that joining together will be the most efficient and cost-effective way to create high-quality program that will meet the needs of kids with poets and disabilities. And as Cheryl has shared with me you know, a, a couple times in the last several weeks, what we're seeing is a continuing increase in the uh, sun type students, students with unique needs, almost increasing at a faster rate than our EBD and other program students. So what we're looking at is students with multiple needs tied together and needing very, very specialized programming and support to be able to be served effectively. So as part of the next steps, we're looking at a joint powers agreement. In your materials, you see a draft joint powers agreement to create the Southeast Minnesota Special Ed Cooperative. It's been drafted. It's currently being reviewed by our legal counsel, who I'm sure will add things to it because that's what legal counsels do, and also put us in a position where each of us will be protected as we go forward. The stated purpose of the agreement is basically to provide that cooperative, true cooperative effort uh, special education programming and related services for member districts and basically to optimize those services that are available. Um, it is our recommendation uh, that the board review that document, the information provided this evening, and at our next board meeting pass a resolution to enter into a joint powers agreement to create the Southeast Minnesota Special Education Cooperative. If your decision is to do that, we're asking all the other boards to do the same thing over the course of the next month and a half with the idea that all of those uh, agreements would be signed off by July 1. If they are signed off by July 1, then we can send a letter to the commissioner requesting that our cooperative be uh, given a district number so they can begin to operate and we would need to move forward with the work that would have to be done in order to begin the co-op process. What we also know is as part of that, as a board, you're going to have to think about the idea that to make this work, you are going to need to identify and appoint a member from this board to serve on the SEMSEC board, basically to function uh, in that position to support special education programming along with the superintendent superintendent and board member from every other district. So it will be a 10 member board and in terms of that kind of, of function we know that we will be able to I believe to address the needs that we have. To give you a little bit more information uh, in terms of the work that's been done so far. The other major piece that Gary was able to create for us is a detailed timeline of the things that would have to happen really didn't want to do another hour for you. I figured uh, probably we were about there right now. I'm, I'm watching eyes. Um, but the timeline is detailed down to each month. What exactly has to happen? Who, you know, what, what uh, things need to be formed? When, when we begin the process of the build out of the building? When we identify and begin to uh, do the work to get a director on board? When do we begin to do the work and prepare to hire staff for the programs? Um, we've also already got a draft uh, created document that would be a employment agreement that would be in place for teachers, an employment agreement in place for paraprofessionals. Um, and so we have basically a, a very good working timeline that will take us forward over the course of the next year. Um, I would be lying to you, but I, I'm, I would say to you, this will be an easy thing. We can, this will be a snap, and we can get this going. However, I think the piece that's important for you to remember is for, I think, the long-term benefit of the students in Northfield that would participate, as well as the students in the other four districts, this is, I think, the strategy that will take us forward uh, over the next 20 years or longer. It is the format that I think, number one, we, we, are, we know that other districts are already there, that we know we need to have a number of districts coming together to really make it work. The good thing about the group that's come together right now, they're all on the uh, 35 corridors, so we're looking at probably uh, everybody being able to reach the SEMSEC 
location within about 45 minutes. We're looking right now at the potential of having this uh, the facility located in Owatonna and working directly with uh, the staff in Owatonna who is working on finding locations and beginning to have a preliminary discussion with landlords about the p potential for long-term lease and the build out of the program. What we also know is if we're planning to have this ready to go by July 1, 2016, we really need to have the entire next year to get ready. It's going to take that long to get the building built out, to get everything done that has to be done to make the board a functional uh, entity to bring out on board all of the staff that need to be in place for the 16th, 17th year. And we really think that we're in a position that we can make that make sense for everybody. So I guess I open it up at this point for any questions that you might have about this proposal. Again, with the, with the idea that this was not meant to be the decision making point tonight, but it's something that we need to have some very, very serious thought and discussion about because if we're going to move forward with this, it really needs to move forward in July. Okay, thank you. Board members, questions? Ellen. So I have one question and sure. one comment. Um, so my comment is that I had talked about this at the Community Services Advisory Board mm -hmm. um, tonight before our board meeting, and Grace, who's one of the members, was a special ed teacher in the district years ago, and she said that the this isn't something new, that Northfield was actually, it was in a, in a yeah, it was part of with, um, she said Kenyon, Montemingo, mm -hmm. Faribault, um, it was different because it wasn't low incidence. So this, it was its own district and operated very much like you're talking about. So I thought that was of interest. Um, my question. Yeah, so co-ops have been around for a long time, mm -hmm. uh, and, and the, the the difference really with this type of co-op, which is different than some, like you know Gary, if you remember, ran the um, River, River Bend, Bend Ed District. Ed district. Mm -hmm. As an Ed District. He was not only responsible for special ed programming, but he also did staff development programming and other kinds of programs for students uh, who were not in special education. The focus in terms of this piece is really focusing tightly on special ed because it really makes the funding piece work better and you don't deal with the issues of trying to demonstrate specifically is the work here being done for special ed purpose. I'm sorry. Go no, ahead. that's okay. So the one question I had is I had asked Val um, if there were any um, things in the proposed budget that would that would be in, um, involved in this, and and she said no because there's too much uncertainty. When this comes before the board for a vote, will there be more information as to whether there are some budgetary items that I mean I understand that a lot of it is the way funding works. It'll just um, Things will flow differently, but I would imagine in the first year that we would, there would be some costs that at least we're floating. It says in the first right. couple of months there will, there will be costs that that will be um, floating, and especially in the, in the year of build up and, and preparing to get things started. A lot will depend on how we negotiate the contract with the uh, landlord. Uh, if we can get the contract, as I would hope we would be able to do, where the build out is basically created as part of the lease and therefore when the building is ready for occupancy we start paying an amount that's equal to the lease cost plus an amortized proportion of the build out that that, that will help to, to reduce those upfront costs on that end uh, but we do know that there will be expenses that will be incurred as we go forward over this next year However, it's fairly minimal until we actually get ready to have people step on board as staff members and the director, which is really, uh, will be getting close to the, to the start of the 16-17 year. And what Gary explained to me, and help me Cheryl if you can on this one, um, the idea being that uh, because we're always paid a year in arrears, mm -hmm that basically the funding from the previous year, even when we begin to implement, we'll be able to use the funding from the previous year to help cover the costs of the new implementation. 
And as we said, it won't, it, it won't be a wash right away, but I think within the first six to eight months, we will be on track. And going forward, then we will have basically a self-sustaining operation in terms of that, of that piece. So um, I think probably in the, in the first year, if you really think about it, it's mainly going to be the board and superintendent meeting somewhere with other boards and superintendents. We'll have to figure out how we cover the costs to get that to happen. Uh, but I'm guessing that most of the, of the initial work will just take a group of people sitting around a table. We'll be going through the policies. We'll be approving policies. We'll be setting up processes. We'll be preparing to do uh, the, um, the uh, recruiting and the uh, hiring of both the director and other staff members, but almost all of that is simply the human capital time of getting those pieces done. But I also I, I just need to be very, you know, upfront with you. For the person that is identified to do this, there's going to be a chunk of additional work that that board member is going to take on to get this done. In the end, I think it's going to be the right move to make going forward, but that's probably the part that's that's isn't isn't doesn't have dollar signs with it but there's a human cost in terms of the work that has to be done to make that go sure that i'm saying okay all right thank you okay is there any other questions no i got more questions we got time for <laughs> but, uh, um, but but we need to be asking these yeah. questions now so either i can get you an answer or i can give you what an i'd like to do is just this my questions and then copy Dr. Richardson okay. in, in a way that he can respond to him so it doesn't, because I, I, some of them are pretty minor incidental, others may have some substance to them. Okay. But uh, I believe it's really a wonderful proposal and I, I think it's to have a severe, uh, significant impact on the educational needs of uh, students of our district. Uh, is the same proposal, one question, being given to the other districts? So they're hearing okay. approximately the same thing? Not approximately, identical. Okay. So, uh, actually, that was part of our discussion when we met with the other soups, business managers, okay. and special ed directors, is we felt it was extremely important that they heard exactly the same presentation, got exactly the same draft of the agreement, exactly the same draft of the resolution. We don't want anybody to um, not share the identical information or be out there saying, well, maybe we could go do this or maybe we could do that. We really need to be able to share the same piece because if we're going to get five districts to commit to moving forward with this, our belief is that they have to be operating from exactly the same set of information. Yes? You're interested in my second question. Okay. They all have the same skin in the game. And they would all have exactly all the right. same skin in the game. So Then the third question is, how does each district measure the six the success of the program, are they measuring on the same measuring stick? And, and I wouldn't know that you need to answer that question right well, now, but I, you may. I, I guess I, I, we'd be looking at measures both in terms of the finance and efficiencies yeah. and also in terms of the effectiveness of the program. And I think in terms of the finance and efficiencies, we're going to be able to pretty quickly get a sense after a year's worth of operation is what, what actually is, are, are we in the worst case scenario where basically we don't save us any money but we have lots more options for kids or are we in a more likely scenario which is we're going to have a, a much better variety of options to meet kids needs but we actually spend a little bit less to get that done. In terms of the educational programming I guess my belief is that when we're able to bring, and Cheryl, help me, when you, the special ed directors talk, what did they believe might be the initial population of the program? Yeah. We're talking about two programs, correct? EBD and SUN? SUN and, um, and the EBD includes our students at day treatment. Okay, well. and day treatment. Um, however, that structure might, might look different than just day treatment. Sorry. <laughs> However, that structure might look a little different than just actual day treatment, you know, meeting the needs of students with emotional behavioral disorders. Um, and our students with unique needs who have multiple diagnoses um, is, is very important. And one of those 
pieces that they have is low cognition and also mental health. And so those are very, very difficult students to work with in a larger setting, um, in a regular school setting, um, and as we said, can have a huge impact on not only the staff, but other students in the environment that they're in. So um, did I answer your question? Uh, so, so, so if we have 19? Oh, 19, what, right. What, what do we think are well, likely to be the numbers from the district? We, we believe, at first we were talking just the SUN program and just SUN students across those five districts, we would have nearly 30 students just with that. So if there are multiple programs, we're thinking closer to 60, having um, probably 18 classrooms to start with and having room to grow and having the appropriate spaces that are um, what I would say even a little more therapeutic than when you walk into the Ken River Education Center, mm -hmm. which was an attempt to create, um, create a, 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 a facility that met these specific needs but we've grown and we've added programming and that space we found over time is really not meeting those needs and that lease is coming to an end at the end of a year from this June 30th as well so there's there's a piece of that is that's impacting us too. Thank you. So timing on that again the timing on the lease for crack kind of coming to an end is going to be right on track with the implementation of this program. As Cheryl said, when they went up and visited the other districts, the, the biggest difference is the providing of smaller individualized classroom spaces for the majority of kids. So when she's, you're thinking to yourself, I'm sure you know that you're talking about 30 or 40 kids and you're talking about 18 classrooms, the, the reality is Will there be times that students will be together in larger groups? Sure. But will there be times when students will need to be in individual spaces? That's also a possibility and a need. And the, the flexibility that that creates in terms of having students, if they're really struggling at a particular time, to be able to have a space of their own uh, where a, an EA or a teacher can deal with that situation without it disrupting the entire rest of the program would be very beneficial. We also would probably be looking at taking the existing space we're looking at and actually separating it with separate entrances and, and so on so that various parts of the program, while they would be in the same building, would be separated from each other so students with in, in one program would not be in with students from another program. One more. Absolutely. What would happen if a member would vote to leave the financial impact and the legal impact and you know is there a critical mass for the number of schools that are necessary to make it work well my sense would be that if we're looking at less than three this is this then is no better than just staying with where we are mm -hmm. what we do know however is we cannot keep the program we currently have so the only other alternative of, instead of doing a co-op would be actually just to say to one of the member districts you run the program and we'll tuition kids there that is not as beneficial to all the districts involved my sense from the discussions we've had with the soups and business managers and special ed directors um, there are there are districts within that group that are absolutely saying I've got to have it and I wish we had it tomorrow I think we have others that are saying well you know we, we can we can hold off a while if we can see the light at the end of the tunnel and know that there's a program coming that's going to be able to meet our needs. We can take the year that we need to get that done. But I wasn't hearing from anybody that they were thinking that they were able to do this on their own. So I, my belief is that this is a not only a very doable piece, but also a very necessary piece for the long-term support of special education students in Northfield. Thank you. Board members, does anyone have any other questions? I have a question. Yes, Jeff. Uh, thanks for your report. Um, my question is just wondering, obviously, on the state budget, we you know, are 40% for education, 40% for health and human services, and I, I think the idea of a co op is a, is a great idea. I'm just wondering, can you give me a general idea of the difference between uh, learning disabilities versus what, let's say, a mental illness would be? Um, 
and, and, and or a disorder and how that goes from a responsibility of education versus health and human services and how those two work together or don't? Sure, I may have you come in and help me here. I, I, I give you the, the layman's perspective on this is that we have a, a significant continuum of services that we need to provide right now. From a student who may need speech services or, or very limited services in terms of support all the way to the students that are in the SUN program and maybe even those students that are one step beyond that that are currently at Laura Baker and probably are in a residential treatment situation where they actually stay at Laura Baker during the day or during the week. Um, I think I think <coughs> what we're seeing in terms of the requirements for special education, it is the, the thrust is that we must provide the least restrictive environment to meet the needs of every single child. And we must be able to demonstrate that that environment is providing us the best opportunity for students to be successful at the level they are. But as you can imagine, a student that needs speech or a student who is learning disabled and may be doing very well in most areas but is struggling maybe in reading or math is a very different student than a student who has emotional behavior uh, disabilities, who is also on the autism spectrum, who also may be struggling with mental health issues. And what we know right now is part of the issue that we're facing is that our current uh, mental health contract that we have with the county will also expire at the end of this year. And the county basically is saying with the new statutory requirements, they really are no longer comfortable running a co-op program or running a joint powers agreement program with us anymore. So they'll be providing um, mental health services, but it will be outside the school day for the most part with some opportunities, I imagine, to have, have people coming in you know, to provide specific services. What we know has happened over the last decade is as they've taken money away from the county and away from the county and away from the county, we've seen a shrinking of the available services that they can provide. And for the most part, the school district needing to take up the slack. I think, I think Chris really answered that very, very well. I'm not sure I have a whole lot to add except for that um, the Department of Human Services is not in the business of educating students. They might be there to provide um, supports to families and children um, outside of the education system. Uh, however, we are under statute and rule uh, and the federal law required to meet all the educational needs of every single child that lives in our district or that is served by our district. And so we have to find a way to do that. Um, Laura Baker is one of the only facilities in the state where their education program is actually under the Department of Health. Um, and so it's very, very unique. Um, and and they, they do serve a very, a very unique and very small population. Um, but as you know, there's a new law out there called the Olmstead Act, which is also pushing us to and pushing the community to um, serve students in the least restrictive or, or individuals and adults in, in the, within the community, not in uh, residential facilities like this or even in larger group homes. They're looking at more naturalized environments for everyone to live and to work. And so that is the movement in that direction. Thank you. Um, board members, others, questions? I had um, a couple questions, if, if you don't mind. Um, so first of all, I do so much appreciate the, the level of detail that this report provides, because it really gives us a framework of realizing how what a significant move this is for us and the number of things that we have to consider. Um, one thing, we certainly articulated how I don't think there's a real concern that we would ever not have enough students, but in terms of um, going away from a um, unique district, would there, if that were to be the case, and, and we'd move it to just one district or whatever, would there ever be that um, maintenance of effort thing that kind of somehow always seems to come back to us in terms of 
restricting us as to how we could um, potentially be flexible with the program or somehow have to adapt the program? Would that come back and it, it is cause a re some concern? really good question, and I think being part of the co op is actually a benefit there, but again, I will ask my expert okay. to reflect on that. Maintenance of effort is not applied to cooperatives, and oh, so that's okay. a benefit to the cooperative. Okay. Um, it does not, it, our, our joining a cooperative does not impact our maintenance of effort because okay. those students are then now being served by another district. Uh, okay. So we would have a reason why we would be um, decreasing our services within our own district mm -hmm. uh, because we have students that have essentially left our district to be served by the cooperative. So there, there's a reason for that. And, okay. and speaking with George Holt um, at the state level, he said that that would be the reason and we would not have to worry about maintenance of effort in that year that we joined the cooperative. But once we're in that, once those students are in that district, then that district is the one that is the onus of the um, maintenance of effort. We continue to have maintenance of effort for our students that we would serve within Northfield School District. Okay. The cooperative would be um, their own district, uh, and actually under cooperative, maintenance of effort does not affect them. I see. Okay, you just articulated that. Okay. So it's another really okay. positive part of Okay, because I know that one always seems to come around. Yes, it does. Okay. Okay. My second question is, would we anticipate that we would have any delays with seeing that timeline through um, from MDE? Or are they pretty quick to say, okay, just... Well, we, we, had, we had Gary actually do the checking with George and others. The commentary was that this would be a very quick turnaround. Okay. That we requested a co-op agreement, and as long as we had the district signing off, whether that's five or less, the district sign off and are ready, ready to go forward, they will basically approve us and they will issue us a number. So it won't be like some of the other things that we deal with, with special ed where there's, or other parts of MBE mm -hmm. where there's a long delay okay. between when you ask for it and when you begin to, to start working. The other thing we'll need to do is also we'll have to request a federal ID number because we now will be our own uh, entity you know, it isn't like we're going to raise taxes, but in terms of purchasing things, we're going to purchase things because we'll have a federal as well as a state ID for <coughs> tax purposes. Okay, and then I just have one last question. Do we have a sense for the pool of applicants we might look to see for the cooperative director position and some of the, the teaching and EA positions, what that might be like out there right now? Go right ahead. <laughs> I know you might thought too. Yeah, that that is difficult. Um, yeah. As you know, uh, we are facing some challenges in um, finding candidates uh, for special education. Uh, however, I, I believe there are uh, people out there that want to lead in this area, and okay. I believe that the key piece is that the cooperative, being its own district and creating its own teacher agreement, is the is the piece that's going to draw people to that kind okay. of position Good. because we're going to be able to compensate them differently and have, I believe, um, some ways that we can uh, help them to do a better job and to support them in, in training that's more specific than what we're even able to do now. We try to do that now with our Canada River mm -hmm. Education Center. It is, it's costly to do that and, and sometimes very prohibitive to do the level of training that we know those folks need. So I think the structure of it, how we're going to support people, is going to be key. Okay. And I would say the other part is, is in, in real estate, location, 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 is everything. Here is not only location, but again, uh, our discussion has been that it's most likely that we would locate this in Boatana, which would be right on the interstate and basically halfway in between. But it's also, I think, beyond location, it's timing. So the idea is that by implementing this program starting July 1 and really a year before we're expecting people to, at least a year before we're expecting people to be on board in terms of staff, it gives us the opportunity to 
to run ads and to basically recruit uh, for staff at the very beginning for the, the director's role and early in the teaching season. So we, I think, would have the best potential. That was one of the discussions we are, had early on is, gee, could we figure out some way to do this for next fall? And we had some of the superintendents that were really, you know, let's do this yesterday. And uh, fortunately, cooler heads prevailed over the course of time. But we just said, that's just not physically possible to get that. We'd rather take that kind of full 12 months to basically get all the pieces done to get it lined up, get everything in place, get everything ready to go, and be ready to, to start with that 16, 17 year. And that's, so I think it's not only we'll have a good location, for the facility, but we'll have a high quality facility, which will be probably better than most other districts have for their staff who are providing support for these kinds of students. And we'll have the luxury of starting from scratch, which means contractually, professional development wise, whatever, we have some real advantages in terms of providing quality programming. As Cheryl said, one of the key pieces is initially thinking about do we want to have some specific types of training that we want all of the staff to basically have. And if you're doing that with two or three or four people, that's really difficult to do. But if you're doing it with a staff of 30 or 40 people, it's much more likely you can bring a trainer in to train an entire building and staff than it, it is if you have to try to send people to another location to get that kind of training done. So we see some real advantages there too. Okay. Thank you. I think it's important that we acknowledge the efforts Dr. Richardson has had. Dr. Richardson has had in getting this. You were really spearheaded. Yeah, this my hair was about darker when yeah. I started yeah. this. So we well, maybe not that much. We've been yet. instrumental in, in leading this um, process through. So thank you for your leadership sure. on that. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Cheryl. Thank you. Okay. Well, we are finally at the end of item for running for it and discussion. So we will move on to the um, actually only item tonight for uh, individual action, and that's the proposed 2015-16 budget for capital and health and safety. As you recall, John Morstorf was here last um, week presenting that to us, so we're actually um, approving that budget here for individual action. So. The superintendent's recommendation is to approve the proposed 2015-16 operating capital and health and safety budget. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Moved by Ann. Second. Second by Ellen. Are there any questions or comments? No? Okay. So we'll move forward. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, we'll move on to approval of the consent grouping. As a reminder, there were a number of items, personnel items in the table file to be added to the consent grouping. Is there anything anyone would like to pull from the consent grouping? Okay, is there a motion to approve the consent grouping? Oh. Moved by Ann. Is there a second? Second by Ellen. All those in favor of approving the consent grouping say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We have two items for information, one being the proposed school board policy 427, which is workload limits for certain special education teachers. Dr. Richardson? Okay, and this is, has been brought about by a change in Minnesota rule, which now requires every school district and state to establish a board approved policy for determining workload limits for special education staff. Basically, we've uh, taken a look at the model policy provided by the Minnesota, Minnesota School Boards Association. We believe that policy is a really good place for us to start with this particular process. Our intention would be as we move forward to have discussions with our special education teachers and our special education director around uh, looking at the details of, of procedure and practice but the policy is such that we believe that the policy in its current format is the version that should be approved. And uh, being that uh, this item, however, is new to you tonight, uh, again, we're recommending that this be considered first reading of this particular proposal and that we would come back on June the 8th for a final approval of policy 427. Okay. 
All right, um, second um, item for information in your packets were the um, school board meeting schedule for July of 2015 through July of 2016. So you get those in your calendar. Uh, reminder of upcoming dates, um, two significant events. Uh, Friday, May 29th at 1 p.m., reminder of the ALC graduation, which takes place at the Longfellow Gymnasium. And then Sunday, May 31st, 2 p.m., and is the um, high school graduation at Memorial Field. And I believe Lori has this in the main office at 1.30. I know she'll send an email, but years past it's been 1.30. So. Reminder of future meetings, Monday, June 8th, and then uh, not an, after that until Monday, July 13th at 7 p.m. With that, I ask for a motion that we adjourn. Moved Move by no Second. Second by Anne. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. We are adjourned. <laughs>